Okay. First of all, um, I have gotten a couple of notes about one of the quizzes since scheduling started this week. I know the notes exist. I haven't had a chance to look at them yet, so I should be able to do that uh, here right after class. Um, the project that I posted, I intend on being a fairly high-level overview. You know, I'm not looking for war and peace here. I'm, my real goal in this, to be perfectly honest, is to give you another project that isn't a huge time builder. If you want to get it to me by Thursday morning at uh, 8, you know, you can turn it in. I'll grade it. Same kind of deal as before. It's due, abs the final version is due absolutely um, a week from today at 8 a.m. Um, I have something that I rarely do, which is I'm going to cancel class Friday for no business reason. I, one of my sons is being ordained, and we have, we have to be in Louisville in the middle of the afternoon, so we're going to have to leave early in the morning. I apologize to you for taking a day out of your semester. I hope you'll understand. <laughs> so, um, what we are going to do for the balance of the semester, I've kind of hint, I've told you about this basically through the whole semester. The most common wireless technology that our graduates encounter, use day to day, need to be eyebrow deep involved in is Wi Fi or more properly 802.11 networks most commonly nowadays 802.11n, starting 802.11ac, you'll still see some 802.11g, and we'll go through what all that alphabet soup means here in a little bit. Um, pace of things is going to change a little bit. The, um, the things we've covered are important. They are things you need to know. wouldn't have taught them if I didn't think they were. But when you look at things like personal area networks and stuff like that, that's not really technology that we do a lot with. Our organizations may use it, but there's not an awful lot of support that goes on with it. RFID systems are the exception to that. I've given you enough to kind of work with whatever's installed in a place. They are typically developed pretty much as a vertical suite of products within one manufacturer. So. You know, we've looked, and then we've looked at uh, metropolitan area networks and wide area networks, which you certainly need to be aware of. But again, you're not directly building the network. This is different. This is stuff that you're actually going to be heavily involved in determining specifications for. You're going to be involved in supporting it, deploying it, and going through that product development life cycle that, you know, if you had 317 or if you're in 317, you know, that continuous cycle of write a spec or determine what your specs are, determine a solution, implement it, test it, monitor it, and when it's not doing what you need it to do, the process starts over and it's kind of a continuous improvement process. That's what you're going to be doing with the wireless network. So we're going to spend the rest of the semester looking at 802.11. Um, we are going to have lab sessions in this. They were going to be crunched kind of right at the tail end of them. My thinking on that is partly practical, selfish practical, and partly practical for teaching. I'll put the selfish practical part of it out of the way first. This is the first time I've taught this course, and we're developing it in an online lab environment, so I don't have labs prepared. <laughs> I'll, I'll get those going. The labs are not deeply in depth, but I do want you to see the actual implementation of stuff we're talking about as we go through this. The uh, teaching practicality in that is I prefer uh, as an instructor to put theory up front, deal with the theoretical questions, and then talk about implementation. So you may, you may take either tack or both of that as my reasoning, but that's the way we're going to do things. Um, there are two chapters in your book. A, uh, chapter 7, if my memory serves, I don't, since I take them out of order, I don't trust my memory. Um, yeah, Chapter 7 refers to this as low speed LANs, and then Chapter 8 deals with high speed LANs. They're both 802.11. 
I prefer to treat that as one lump because there's stuff from those low speed lands that we still deal with. It's still part of the protocol. So I'm going to deal with them that way. I, I assigned chapter 7 for you to read before this morning and we'll kind of base this week's discussion on that. Uh, we will, this one presentation I'm getting ready to pull up is what we will do this week. Uh, I want to get you on firm historical and high level theory um, firm ground <laughs> before we go any further and so over the weekend I'll have you do um, some exercises and some stuff to, to uh, look at this. Okay, let's see here from beginning. So, when we talk about 802.11 networks, we're talking about something that goes back to, oh, late 90s, somewhere in there. And it was originally defined. You had to kind of think about this in context. Originally, wireless networks were not designed for the kind of huge deployment that we see now. They were a problem solver. They were related to the other 802 protocols very closely, specific, particularly Ethernet, but also Token Ring and some of the others that you still saw out there. Um, they were designed to deliver data at a reasonable rate to hard to reach places, places where I couldn't get cable. The idea of this mobility that we have now, where, you know, between the, there are six of us in this room and we probably have ten wireless devices between us, that kind of no mobility had not been thought of. It wasn't part of the original design, okay? So we've got to kind of keep that in mind. The ori those original networks, and they used some, some very different technology than you see now. They used uh, frequency hopping was the first one, which is not, no longer used. Then they used a uh, fairly low-level form of direct sequence in the second one. Um, they offered two megabits of data bandwidth, which sounds puny until you realize that most wired networks at that point ran at 10 megabits. And remember, we're talking about how do we deliver something as a problem solver, not how do we deliver wireless mobility to massive numbers of people. So our world has kind of changed underneath us as we talk about this. And we're gonna, I'm going to frame a lot of our discussion in that. Here's a little bit of a timeline. We're talking about 97. You had the first 802.11 spec come out. Uh, it ran, like I said, at one or two megabits per second at 2.4 gigahertz. Notice the uh, protocol structure up there. 802 is the overview and how data networks work. When you draw a high level picture of a network, you know, you have machines, you have shared media, and you have some way of sharing that shared media and independently addressing these devices. All of those layer one and two things that you learned a long time ago, that's what we mean by the overview and architecture. It's just this was a wireless medium instead of a wired medium. That was the extent of it. You can really think of it, it's kind of a low level view, but you can really think of it as simply a different layer one implementation of Ethernet. I mean, that's really what it was. The framing was very similar. 802.1 describes management for these networks. 802.3, uh, 802.5 both describe uh, different wide networks, you know, Ethernet and token ring. You had several different 802.11 areas. Notice they all share a layer two. And then layer one, you had frequency hopping, you had direct sequence, you had OFDM, you had yada, 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 yada. We varied the layer one. Why? Because that world was changing underneath us. This problem solver for an occasional place that I needed to deliver moderate speed data to a hard to reach place turned into everybody started carrying devices that could use this protocol. And so we needed, A, to be able to move data faster so I can get through with your transfer and get to yours. I can support more people. 
and just the application drivers behind this were requiring more and more and more data. You know, I doubt if anybody in this room would be really happy with the wireless network now that ran at two megabits. And that was fantastic <laughs> these days, you, particularly when you figure that Ethernet as a wired protocol moved data at 10 or 100. Most networks at that point were 10 megabits a second. But that's just how fast theoretically it can move data. It actually only moved data throughput at 5 to 6 megabits. By the time you got rid of all the overhead and all the latency in the, in the protocol and all that. So in a simplistic way, we can think about this as simply Ethernet over a different type of media. As we move further and further into the protocols that come closer to what we're talking about today, that's going to get harder and harder to see, and I hope to make that clear as we go through uh, the next little bit. Um, you are talking about a protocol that basically addresses, or a family of protocols, I should say, that addresses um, layer one and two. So we have how the physical layer, that radio module that we looked at early in the semester, um, works, what frequency are we working at, how do we actually signal a bit, or how do we use a symbol to signal multiple bits. That's what this part defines. Then we define a MAC layer, which really isn't that different from Ethernet. It's, you know, there are a few little different things in there, but at layer two, we're really doing pretty much the same thing. We're going to fragment it differently because of differences in the physical layer. Um, so we started off one or two megabits, started off at 2.4 gigahertz. A couple of years later, the, it had caught on enough. Actually, 802.11a came out first, but wasn't ratified first. It, so you get this little weird thing going on. So the update was actually out there first, but it didn't get ratified, so it has a later date. 802.11a was a... Um, in, uh, physical layer implementation that works at 5 gigahertz. It supported speeds up to 54 megabits. This was a backbone. That's what it was designed for. Uh, oddly enough, you still see 802.11a out there alive and well. We installed some earlier this year. There are some applications where it's a perfectly good solution and doesn't have the overhead that some of the newer protocols have. So it's, it has found a niche market that's still pretty happy with. Moving on up, we got 802.11b. This was the one that really, really pushed the expansion. B caught right at the time when we were doing that transition in the cellular network from analog and short messaging to actually being able to do packetized data. That was happening about the same time. So people were getting used to the idea of mobility. You know, I like being able to pull out my device wherever I'm standing and transfer data. Cellular networks were very slow at that time. If you remember, those data rates ran in the kilobits. Okay, well, if I'm, and I pay for them by usage. So in my workplace, and later in my home, I'd like to have that same mobility with devices, but I'd like to have it move data faster, and I'd really rather not pay you by the megabyte or whatever. So we jumped up our rates, 802.11b, jumped the uh, over-the-air protocol so that we could support 5.5 megabits or 11 megabits, which put it on a par with wired networks of the day. Still ran it at 2.4 gigahertz. And that caught on hugely. Um, it was the right combination at the right price point. This was in, in the hundreds of dollars, not thousands. So expensive compared to wired, but not prohibitively so. So, you know, we could afford to roll this out pretty easily. Huge expansion in the market, and of course the needs as you get an installed base and more people use it, more people write applications for it, you know, you get that whole cycle going. Well, now we've developed, we've built out these 802.11b networks and for some reasons we'll look at a little later, we need to do something differently. We're, we're, we're getting to a bottleneck now. We can't support the numbers that we need. 802.11g came out in 2003. 
Um, jump the speeds up. More importantly, it changed the over-the-air protocol. It was far more robust than 802.11b. Um, you remember my catchphrase I've used all semester, all things being equal, you can't compare 2.4 gigahertz B and G directly. They just don't compare. They're doing things differently. You can compare them, but you can't, you know, when you start getting under the hood, the comparisons don't stand up because things just work differently. 802.11g is more robust across the physical layer interface. It stands up to interference better. So they are more different than the numbers here show. Uh, the low speed picked up a little bit. Top speed, it's about five times as fast. Part of that is just better processing power that we could shrink down to a chip. We've gotten pretty good at doing that at that point. That stayed uh, for six years, which, you know, if you look through that timeline, that's, that's a long period. And if you think back through how protocols in our world stay around, that's a pretty long lifetime for an implementation of a network type. Um, 2009, we got 802.11 in. Notice what's happened with the speeds. We don't double. We don't triple them. We're taking speeds up to 10 to 20 to 40 times as fast. We are also notice now that these were all associated with one or the other frequency bands. Okay? Using these, we've built out a network. We're going to look at some of the problems that we had doing this, but we've built out a network that has lots of people on it. We're moving data pretty fast, and we've run up against the wall again. We're supporting so many people. The applications require so much bandwidth that we're running out of space again. There is a problem that spectrum for this is limited, and sharing algorithms only stretch so far. Yes, we're going to look at those. So when we did 802.11n, we took a different approach. Instead of tightly tying this particular subgroup of 802.11 to a particular frequency band, we wrote the coding algorithm and then let the physical be defined in a couple of bands. So we can use either 2.4 or 5 gig. And we actually gave some options in there with how we do over the air coding. That's where we got part of that great speed increase. The major thing 802.11n did, and we'll, we'll dig into it pretty deeply, the major thing is 802.11n recognized the fact that you have multipath, that you are going to have multipath. For the, the protocols up through G, multipath was a problem. You know, we recognize it. It's cancellation. It's, it's an issue we have to deal with. And it tended to limit range. Okay, if I stop looking at multipath that is something bad that happens to my signal when I launch it, and start looking at it as a way to move two different streams of data, all of a sudden, what have I just done? I've increased my carrying capability. I've increased the amount of data I can put across this radio link by using two different paths. And so what you end up with is instead of having a single modulation scheme that basically we change the speed as we get further out, we have lots of modulation schemes. In fact, they have a particular name. They're called MCS values, modulation encoding scheme. And they take into account how many transmitters, plural, and how many receivers, plural, we have at each end of that link. So we actually support multiple links. Well, what happens if I'm sending, instead of one link with six megabits, I send four links with six megabits for a duplex? Now I've got a vastly faster system. So that's the kind of span of technology. We've moved from solving the occasional problem using a fairly simple wireless implementation of a wired protocol up through a wireless only protocol that can support what we would consider 
you know, fast user speeds up to, you know, reasonable backbone speeds. I'll warn you up front, the alphabet soup that is our world goes on steroids when you start talking about 802.11 protocol. I'm going to give you a few that you need to be able to keep out, but realize there are, I think the last time I looked, there are 26 of these. And they're writing more all the time. <laughs> so we've even gone to two letters. The newest one is 802.11ac. So, okay. So with that moving along, what are, um, <laughs> what do we count on as basic information? Well, some things that have not changed are the basic components of this from the beginning. We still have a station, and the station is the user end of things. I'm carrying, you know, my iPad, which I actually didn't bring down here this time. That's my station. Station defines a role in this communication process. And that role changes depending on some choices we make, and we'll look at that. But it's not just saying that it's the user end of things, because you can actually have infrastructure devices that operate as stations. We'll get, in, we'll get into that as we go. Stations, we have things called access points. Oh, yeah, great. I came to class to be told about an access point. Okay. Access point, again, is a function. It's not just a physical device. Now, it probably has the most one-to-one -one relationship between the function and a recognizable device of anything we're going to talk about. But access point is a function on an 802.11 network. And it accomplishes certain things in this communication. Obviously, we have the medium. In this case, when I say medium, what I'm talking about is a, cho a choice of frequency spectrum, 2.4 gig, 5 gig, now we're using 60 gig for some of these, and an over-the-air protocol. Okay, So that's our medium. The original system, again, was designed essentially as a bridge. Remember bridges? Not just like switch bridges, but way back when, Bridges were used to extend land segments past the limit that local cabling could could jump. So if I had a land here in Murray, this is 1980s. If I had a land here in Murray on coax, and I had a land in Paducah on coax that I needed to connect, I would connect them with a bridge that spoke Ethernet on one side, the land side and then use some other protocol, usually a serial protocol, run it across a T1, and I could run traffic across that selectively. What the bridge did, remember the bridge on each end lived on the local area network. And so you had a land side and a wide area net side, or a bridge side. Okay? That meant I could make decisions on traffic if I learned what devices were on the land side and what devices were not by address, then I can make decisions based on destination. So I'm paying a lot of money for this wide area net bandwidth. What the bridging protocol is going to do is say, look at every single packet that comes on the land, and it's going to say, does this packet need to cross me, cross the bridge? Do I need to repeat it on my outside port? For it to reach its destination. That's the actual bridging protocol. Now, we use it in switching in all sorts of advanced ways now. At the time this was being developed, it's a pretty basic definition. I'm going to bridge from one protocol, an over-the-air wireless radio protocol, to another protocol, whatever my wired network is. Typically, it's Ethernet, of course. And I'm going to take that data, and if it needs to go across this interface, I will repeat it across the interface. So we have a bridging function going on in the uh, access point. Also, I'm acknowledging the fact, particularly in the later versions of the protocol, that this station 
may be in somebody's hand walking across here. And sooner or later, I'm going to get in that same situation that we had with cellular, where I'm going to get kind of on the fringe of this one, while simultaneously I'm getting closer to this access point. So there has to be a function to transfer this machine so that it, instead of sending data to this access point to be bridged in, it now sends data to this access point to be bridged in. What did I just describe? A cellular network. That's what this is. This is a cellular network solution if we use access points and, and, and distribution system. And again, we'll dig into that. So the key pieces, like I said, typically it was Ethernet. And that. The key pieces in this could be combined a couple of ways. The simplest form of doing this is to allow stations to directly communicate. And you've probably done this. You ever played a game just, you know, laptop to laptop or something? Then you use uh, an ad hoc network, is the term you see a lot of times. What you created was something called an independent BSS, independent basic service set. A basic service set are those things it's the minimal set of requirements that has to be there, minimal set of functions, I should say, to accomplish this communication. I have to identi uniquely identify other stations on the network. I have to have a way to share the medium. I have to have a way to detect error and ask for retransmission. All those sorts of things that we do at layer two. That's what the BSS does. The independent part is that we're doing this station to station. Okay? And you can do this with you know, lots of stations communicating together. In fact, you still see this done if you walk into uh, conference rooms. People will sit down and they'll open up uh, an ad hoc network. It's nowadays done as often using Bluetooth as it is with 802.11, but the idea is the same. It works. It's very simple. It's tough to expand. It's tough with mobility. I mean, I can be mobile within this room doing this. You know, we're all out. We all have our device out. We design, you know, John's net or whatever, and everybody joins it. I can be mobile in this room, but as I walk down the hall, pretty quickly I'm going to walk out of the range of all these devices. And more to the point, I've got to stay. Notice there's no central device here. For this network to function, I have to be within range of everybody else on the network. Think about how this protocol is working. This is CSMA. So how are we sharing the medium? What does CSMA do to share the medium? What's it stand for? Okay, multiple access means we have multiple devices using that same segment. What's carrier sense mean? Exactly. The way I know it's okay to transmit is I listen to the medium. In this case, I'm listening to a particular frequency using a particular particular coding scheme, and I'm listening to see if anybody else is transmitting. Great. In this room, no problem. Now, imagine that we are out in this hall and we start up at the front dome, and every 50 feet, one of us stands. <laughs> so one of you is up in the front dome, one of you is about halfway down the hall, let's say 100 feet. The building 700 feet long, we got seven, six of us in here. So somebody's in the front dome, halfway down the hall, at the corner up here, about outside this room. You see what I'm doing? 802.11 radio isn't going to reach that far inside. But if we're all on the same network, how will you at the dome know if I, down at the chair's office, transmit? The answer is you won't. What I just described is something called a hidden node problem. It's where there is a user that's outside the range of some of the users. I'll I'll give you a, this is the overview section, so I'll give you a full 
layout of the hidden node problem. But when you get a situation where you have users that cannot be heard by everyone, what happens when they transmit? What happens to our network sharing? It breaks down. So the ad hoc mode is only feasible in a relatively small area. I couldn't use ad hoc mode for a campus-wide network, for example. Everybody, I mean, we could build one, and everybody that happened to be close by would do it, but the throughput would dive if everybody were trying to do that across the campus area. The answer to that, of course, is infrastructure. And both of these, by the way, are defined in the very first protocol. That's what I mean that some of this stuff is still with us all the way through. Infrastructure BSS means that we define a central device. That device has some particular things that it is required to do. One is it has to be the center of all communication. So instead of users communicating directly with each other, excuse me, instead of users communicating directly with each other, users communicate only with the access point. That means that the users aren't going to conflict with each other. If I go out of the ramp to the access point, I can't communicate. It also means that the access point knows, in quotes, what devices are on the network. It keeps a list of who's there. And when a device comes on and turns on and decides to join a network, the access point and the device agree on what over the air protocol we're going to use. How are we going to share the medium? That varies with protocol. So in other words, we move from just a convenient way for a group to work close together to something that we can expand. I put this access point up on a tall pole, and now I've got pretty good coverage. Since we build, since we have that distribution function, I can also expand this by adding further access points. So instead of having one access point on a tall pole, and that's the range of my network, I can put access points where people are and connect them to an infrastructure network. I can connect them with a cabled network. Okay. Now we're getting to what you recognize as the system. And what happens is we have each of these units creating its own BSS, its own basic service set. So the users that associate with AP1 are going to use basic service set 1, and the users that associate with AP2 will be in basic service set 2. If we do things that way, I've provided coverage, but I haven't provided one network. I can still access this backbone, but every time I move across one of these boundaries, I'm going to have to restart all my communication. So we're still missing that distribution piece. When we add the ability for these APs to say one of this user, user C, is moving, and I need you to take over user C because you can hear him better than I can. We add that, we add that distribution function, the cellular uh, intelligent network function. What we create is something called an extended service set. Now, the way you've seen this, if you've ever set up multiple access points using, you know, that are the same network, what did you do to make them the same network? You gave them the same SSID. The SSID, remember I told you about acronym HELL? Here we go. <laughs> the basic service sets are identified by a substation ID, SSID. If I run them as independent ones, the way we were looking at them a minute ago, if I run it like this, each of these will have a different SSID. John's net, David's net, Marsha's net, whatever. When I add an ESS, what I do is create an overall logical network. Each AP manages its own basic service set, but they're identified with this larger construct called an ESS. Now I can build a network that seamlessly 
read roaming, read I don't have to change, restart communication as a user walks from the coverage area of this AP to the coverage area of this AP. That distribution function, which is part of establishing an ESS, goes to work, and we change. The process is actually called association when a user comes on, talks to this AP, and says, I want to exchange information. Okay, here we go. The ESS allows that association to change. Okay. Now, we've covered a bunch in about... 40 minutes, and we'll spend the rest of the semester essentially digging into what we just went through. Okay, <laughs> got a little bit more that I want to hit. Is this where I want to stop for today? Yes, this actually is where I want to stop for today. Let me say a couple more things on this. Notice that we have we have defined some requirements. This is the world. 2000, thereabouts, multiple access points. We can build an ESS so we can have multiple basic service sets in the same ESS so that they function as one network. The requirement at this point, and this is a big difference, the requirement is I have to have a hardwired network. I have to have Ethernet, which was the common one, or some other hard network behind them. I cannot use wireless to connect those devices. At this point, we're so far ahead of what we've been able to do, that's not a problem. This is great. We just run cable to a few places, and we put radio out on everything, and we cover it in. You know what happens as soon as you have one of those nice rosy pictures up. It takes about six months, and all of a sudden, somebody's tearing up the roses. We're going to stop at this point for now. Let me, in, let me tell you where we're heading just so you can keep it, so, you, so it won't confuse you as we discuss things. The ability to build an ESS where these backbone links are provided wirelessly was developed later, and it's called Wireless Distribution System, WDS. We will talk about it. I don't want to talk about it right now. It makes things more complicated to discuss. So our world for the next couple of weeks is this. Extended service set, we have a, a well-developed protocol where I can have multiple APs sharing an a network identity, and they are connected with the hard network. Our assumptions will be that you connect to a router somewhere to get out to other networks. Here's why I make that distinction. That access point function most commonly these days is only one function that that radio box does. Most of them implement at least a router. Many of them implement firewall. Many of them will allow you to do multiple ESSs on one physical set of hardware. Obviously, that makes the world a lot more complicated. We're going to discuss each of those, but I want to stop our, I want to stop our world, <laughs> if you will, at this point until we get the basics down. Okay, So multiple APs, shared network identity for an ESS, and a hardwired backbone that uses a router out here somewhere to get to other networks. Are we okay? Okay. Um, we'll leave it there for today. I promise you I will get your project, your project two's, re you know, the second submission's graded and out. I'm sorry I'm just swamped. <laughs> so, and I, I didn't time giving that out very well with the rest of the work I had to do. I'm sorry? Thank you. No, I did not. Let me stop the recording.